the Bean Ninjas podcast, where you get an all-access pass to see what happens behind the closed doors of a fast-growing global bookkeeping and financial reporting business. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bean Ninjas podcast. And today I'm chatting with Tommy Griffith, who previously managed SEO at PayPal and Airbnb and now runs ClickMinded, which is a digital marketing training platform for marketers and entrepreneurs. In our chat, Tommy talks through him building ClickMinded as a side project while he was working full-time at Airbnb, what his transition looked like from taking the business from side hustle to working full-time, and then his growth story with ClickMinded and how and why he brought on a co-founder four years into the business. The co-founder topic is particularly interesting to me, having worked with a couple of different co-founders at Bean Ninjas. So we shared stories around that. Enjoy the episode. Hey, Tommy, welcome to the show. Meryl, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I was trying to think back to when I last saw you in person. And listeners of the show will remember that well, often we talk about the Dynamite Circle and I think the last time that I saw you, we were sitting on a bus together on our yes. way to the Speakers and Sponsors Dinner, and you just delivered an opening keynote. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. I think we were on our way to drink beers on a boat in Thailand, I think was where we were, <laughs> where we were headed, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so what are you up to now? Tell me a little bit about your backstory and your business. Yeah, so we, yeah, so it's been... How long has it been since then? That's been two or three years, right? So nothing's happened. Um, everything, no, no. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of changes. How do I even begin? I am full time now on my business. Yeah, so I run ClickMinded. ClickMinded is a, a digital marketing training platform for uh, entrepreneurs and marketers. It started as a side project. I wrote a post recently, kind of summarizing the last couple of years of how the business went, but I started it eight years ago as a physical in-person SEO sort of training course. I've been doing SEO for the last 10 years. I managed search engine optimization at two large tech companies in Silicon Valley, PayPal and Airbnb. And I started teaching SEO to startups on the side. While I was doing that, I was kind of right place, right time with the online learning sort of online course renaissance that happened. And in 2012, I created an online course uh, for Udemy that sort of took off and took off and took off. And a couple years in, I my online course eventually eclipsed my salary at Airbnb. I was using the product at Airbnb to train up my own team. So I was just a team of one on the SEO team at Airbnb for a while. Eventually, by the time I left, there were 12 people on the team. And I was using the product to train people up at, at Airbnb. Two years ago, I left Airbnb to go full-time on the business. And pretty much every horrifying thing you could imagine <laughs> over the last two years has happened. Huge successes, huge failures, lots of travel in between. It has been quite an adventure. I'm interested to chat about the last two years. But before we get into that, what was your thought process around going from side hustle to going full time in the business? Were there different factors that you were considering? Was it something like, certain amount of money in the bank account or with a revenue of quick minded What was your thought process there? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I had a lot of people because I reached, I sort of eclipsed my salary third year into the business. Actually, Dan and Ian of Tropical MBA and the Dynamite Circle, they talk about this principle a lot called the thousand day rule, right? That in general, you need to work on your side project for about a thousand days for it to hit your current salary. And it was shocking to me how accurate that was. I hadn't heard about this. And then when I went back and I actually counted down to the day and I was like 1,030 or something. I mean, it was yeah. really scarily accurate. The one thing I actually brought this up in a thread in the forum, I do want to debate whether or not you need to be full-time on that because the current law states, not that they're, very formal about this, but what's been proposed is that you need to be working on the side project for a thousand days full time. And I actually disagree with that. I do think it's about a thousand days, but I think it can be done part time. I think you can get it done 10 or 20 hours a week. But there's a little side tangent. Yeah. So 
I had made the amount of my salary, but I didn't end up leaving for probably another two years after. And I had a lot of friends that kind of said, you're crazy. Why haven't you left yet? I think there were a couple of things. The first was I just wasn't ready personally. I wanted to improve the product more. I had stuff I wanted to finish at work. You know, I was dating someone, right? Like there was stock stuff going on. There's just a lot of like, I just wasn't ready. But aside from that, ClickMinded was probably my like at least 10th attempt at a business, but maybe 15. And, you know, some of those attempts were a year long, some of them were a month long, but I'm really good at failing. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> so good. I mean, if you want someone to mess everything up, and drive a website into the ground, call me up because I, <laughs> I'm great at it. And so I was, you know, I had the best job in the world and was doing a lot of cool stuff. And it was not at all a sure thing to go full time on this thing. And I wasn't like office space where I was like, you know, dragging my head into my cubicle every day. I was working in one of the best places you could ever work. So yeah, it just, I wasn't ready on a number of categories and I knew how easy it was to mess up. And so I really took my time in leaving. And was it hard creating the time when you were working full time in a cool job to dedicate that time to work on a side hustle? So I can imagine if you've got a job that you enjoy, you've probably got a social life, you had a girlfriend, how did you actually carve out the space and time to work on your side project week in, week out? Yeah. The key is have friends that hate you, have a girlfriend that hates you. Have a... <laughs> There's no secret to this at all. You have to pick things and the other things start to decay and die. And it's horrible. It's horrible. You really do have to, I think I said this, I was talking with someone else about this, like you have to relentlessly say no to a lot of social defaults to get this stuff done, right? So friends, birthday and the picnic in the park and a lot of the stuff and the social life definitely did suffer i think the motivation it's a topic i've spent 10 years learning practicing and working on search engine optimization that's incredibly nerdy i would never tell anyone at the bar that right but i have i have and i love it it was easy for me on saturday mornings to wake up and go work on it. i really like it but with that said i think the other part of the motivation. I was in a sort of an awkward spot because while I did like my job and I wasn't ready to leave, I was very sick of the city. I hate people who are in San Francisco that absolutely love it are going to hate me for this, but I was so over San Francisco. I was there for six years. I was probably ready to go after two or three years. And so I was very much ready to get out. And, you know, I love to travel. So I was very motivated to sort of build that little raft to take out out of the port and out of the city while I wasn't done with work and done with like, you know, people I'd met there, I did know that I wasn't going to be there forever. And so that was kind of motivating to wake up on Saturday mornings. Like, okay, this has to work because you do not want to live in the city anymore. So we got to make this happen. And were you always good at saying no to social events? When I remember meeting you in person, you seem like a pretty social kind of guy. So is that something that you had to learn or... or... <laughs> I'm good at drinking beers, if that's what you're saying. <laughs> that was actually a big problem for me because, yeah, I do. I'm like a loud, obnoxious guy who likes to have fun, be the center of attention, rally everyone together and things like that, right? And so when you're someone who's like that and generally extroverted, and then you suddenly stop showing up, it infuriates people. You set expectations really high. And then when you don't show up, it's not. I think the impact of not showing up is higher than if you if you are more reserved. And yeah, it's just to be frank, I pissed off a lot of friends in doing it. And you know, really close friends had less of an impact, they kind of get it, but not everyone did and it was really really hard. But there was an interesting trade-off. I'm fascinated by the kind of social experiment that this whole thing was in my life because People always want it both ways, right? Like I would end up when the side project started to grow to the point where it started to get big and I would talk about it, you know, I'd hear people say, oh, that's amazing. I want to do something like that. That, you know, that's really cool. I'm definitely going to do that. You know, I'm going to start on that tomorrow. And then the next time you see them, they're like, you know, on their 11th beer at the bar, like completely <laughs> passed out, right? They're like, you know, or they're 
smoking in the park or whatever it is. And I'm not saying, oh, oh, you're not disciplined enough for this and that, but it's just that the actions never lined up with the words. And, you know, not to be rude, but just to be super direct, surprise, surprise, all of those people are in the same job, in the same city, doing the same things, hanging out with the same friends. And that's not necessarily bad. You know, some of my closest friends from high school are the happiest people in the world and they've not left their house, their job, their friends in 10, 20 years. But your actions have to line up with your words. And so I knew exactly what I wanted and something had to give. So let's get into the last two years that you've talked about. So you're full-time in ClickMinded and you mentioned there's been some highs and there's been some lows. So tell me about it. Yeah, so mostly lows. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so left San Francisco and decided to go traveling and building the business. And I think the biggest mistake I made first was everything I was just sort of mentioning before, which is that I gave myself a really long time to plan and plot. And like, because I wasn't done with work and wasn't, you know, leaving the city right away, I think what happened was I really set expectations for myself that were bananas, you know, and this kind of stuff, especially in the day of Instagram and travel blogging and the most attractive people you've ever seen in your life jumping into waterfalls and, you know, with their laptops on the beach. And you're like, that's going to be me tomorrow. You know, I'm going to Bali. And it's just ridiculous. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And so, of course, I thought that's what was waiting for me on the other side of that plane ticket, you know? Surprise, surprise, when you end up in that youth hostel, in that dingy youth hostel with mold on the side of the wall, <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the same thing. But yeah, so what happened was I decided to go all in on the project. I clicked mine. It was an SEO training course. And the basic hypothesis was let's expand to seven courses, right? There's a massive need for digital marketing training. There's a ton of universities in the United States that charge forty to ninety thousand dollars a year for a master's degree in digital marketing. It's completely pointless for these degrees, right? The basic society is not prepared to teach people digital marketing, but we're going to need a lot more of it. People are learning on their own. They're learning through blog posts and or in YouTube videos, or they're teaching themselves, or their bosses are saying, "Hey, I know we hired you for this." type of marketing, but actually, can you learn that type of marketing? And so there's a lot of just self-teaching out in the game right now. And the basic hypothesis is let's move from an SEO course to a fully comprehensive digital marketing training platform. Seven courses targeting entrepreneurs, marketers, in-house marketers, small to medium-sized businesses, things like that. And kind of the digital boot camp sort of phase, right? Between online courses and you know digital marketing boot camps. Basically filmed a bunch of new content with that hypothesis, brought it all to Bali and started to work on everything. And just everything went wrong, right? I like, I was so excited. I'm like, I'm a digital nomad now, right? I finally escaped the trenches of San Francisco. You know, I filmed this new product with a friend of mine and I had it all on this hard drive and I started putting it together. And like within the first two weeks, it was just a nightmare. I was robbed by the police my second day in Bali. (laughs) I got food poisoning and started throwing up everywhere. I found out that all the filming we did, I did three days of filming all these courses and it was raining on this warehouse I'd rented out. And so all the audio was nearly ruined. For two weeks, it sounded like it was completely ruined and I have to reshoot everything. We spent $15,000 shooting everything and thought I'd lost all of it. I left the hard drive with all that footage on a bus (laughs) <laughs> and like got it a day later, but thought again, I lost it all. And so like, I'm sitting there a weekend into my digital nomading, you know, one week before I was looking at Instagram photos of, you know, the hottest people you've ever seen all in Bali. And then I'm sitting in Bali, it's pouring rain, I have food poisoning. I have this hard drive that I paid $15,000 for with terrible audio. I'm clutching my chest. The police had just robbed me. And I'm looking up at the sky thinking about, you know, I had the best job in the world in San Francisco. My friends are there. Like breakfast, lunch, and dinner paid for, you know, Airbnb credit to travel every quarter. And I'm just sitting there looking at the sky like, what did I do? Why am I here? Like, why did I give this up? And it was just this 
what's that called? Like the hero's journey where <laughs> like, what's the opposite of that? Where you go like backwards, like deep into hell for no reason at all. And there's no point. Like that's sort of what it felt like. It was not good. And so where did things lead from there? Yeah. So first things first, like I looked in the mirror and I was like, okay, let's stop throwing up and getting robbed. That's the first, <laughs> that's the first plan. And eventually the big turning point was bringing on a co-founder, which was very controversial. Most of the people I asked about this told me not to do it, but I ended up doing it. Throughout my business, I'd always used the apprenticeship model. So I'd always usually at any time had one apprentice helping out with stuff. And my last apprentice was Eduardo. He's absolutely amazing guy from San Francisco. We'd worked together for about six months. He went on his way. I went on my way. We still stayed in touch and were collaborating on a couple different things. But he was in New York. And I basically emailed him and said, Hey, man, quit Airbnb. I have $15,000 worth of footage. I want to go huge with turning ClickMind into this way bigger thing. But I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And just like, you know, sliding into his inbox like, so what are you doing, man? Like, (laughs) how busy are you these days? And that was a, a really pivotal point because you know, I have certain things I was good at, but Eduardo, my now co-founder, is a really good generalist. He's really good. He was really good at setting the strategy for the business. He ended up being our customer avatar, right? kind of the person we were targeting. And this is kind of a faux pas in the entrepreneurial world, but his vision for where we could take this was actually much, much stronger than mine. Right? I had certain things I'm good at, but his vision for where we should take it was way better than mine. The way he communicated it resonated more than anything I could communicate. And so I did what was kind of controversial, which is like, I sort of put him in the driver's seat and just got out of his way. And a lot of people that I asked for advice on that disagreed with it because, you know, you could look at it a couple different ways. I was on year four or five of the business. I'd grown it into six figures on my own. Why bring a co-founder on at that stage? But to me, it was pretty obvious at that point. Yeah, when I heard that you'd brought on a co-founder, I thought, hmm, interesting, risky. Even though I am someone that has brought on a co-founder, which is Wayne, who's been on this podcast many times, and it's worked out really well for us. But it's still, the, my first thought was, oh, that's a, an interesting and maybe a, a risky move. So tell me a little more, when you first got in contact with Eduardo, you must, having worked with him previously, had a bit of a sense of what his skill set was. When you reached out to him, were you intending that he would come in and take on that visionary role within the business? So what were you hoping for when you first got in touch? No, I had no idea. (laughs) I had absolutely no idea. And in fact, the first time I had emailed him, it was sort of before everything was going horribly wrong. I had actually just wanted to work with him again. I said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Do you want to get involved? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And he just basically just said no. He was like, nah, eh, we've worked together before. That sounds not that interesting. I got my own thing. Pass. <laughs> and so he rejected me. It's like the reoccurring theme of my life is just constantly getting punched in the face and rejected <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> and the second time around, it was like, I don't actually know what the trigger point for him was, but it was some variation of, hey, like, I'm actually more excited about the goal now and I've done a bunch of the hard work, but I'm really, really, really bad at the operations and executing it. And I think maybe he thought it was more of a... I should have to ask him. Maybe I'll give you an update later. But maybe he thought it was more of a pipe dream and like I'm just a crazy guy sending him emails beforehand. And then afterwards, once everything, once the product was like closer to the finish line, he was more interested. I'm not really sure. But what ended up happening was sort of brought him on board just to like, hey, let's polish this and get the product live. He sort of came on for that. And then once we had one successful, once we sort of created a successful product, then we sat down and said like, what do you think? You know, because he was living in New York. He really liked his job as well. He had a lot of options. And it wasn't until we sort of turned the raw materials into an actual product that we sat down and said, okay, let's set some goals around this and Let's bring them on full time. I'm actually curious with you though, like when you brought on your co-founder, what was your calculus there as well? Because I have to admit a big part of mine was, was desperation. And it was like, not only is this not working, but I'm no longer confident in my own ability to do this. 
I want to bring on someone else. Was there, was your back against the wall or did you just want to grow a lot more? Like what was your sort of mental calculus? Yeah, it was interesting. So Wayne had read a blog post that I'd written about, we were sharing income reports at the time and he was running his own bookkeeping business and was really interested in the way that we were being transparent, which is pretty unusual in the accounting industry and how Mm. quickly we were growing. And so he commented on the post and then got in touch with me and asked if I would jump on a call with him to talk about what we were doing at Dean Ninjits. And he had reached out to other people running accounting firms too, and no one else got back to him. And I jumped on a call and just to happy to have a chat. And then from there, he actually submitted a, filled out our jobs form on our website and applied for a job at Bean Ninjas, even though he already had his own business. But he was really interested in joining Bean Ninjas with the potential of becoming a partner. So we had those conversations at the very beginning that he would be interested in coming on as an employee or a contractor. And then he actually worked for two years with the intention that if he performed well, that he would have the opportunity to then become a partner and have equity in the business. But it wasn't guaranteed if he performed well and he did really well. But I was happy to have those early conversations knowing that with the scale that we wanted, I'd need another partner to help me grow it. Interesting. My back wasn't against the wall. It was more that I felt like I needed someone else alongside of me. And I was happy to test working together and see where it took us. Did you, when you eventually made him the offer to like be a co-founder, did you, did it keep you up at night? Did you feel like it was risky? Were you worried? I think because we talked about it from the very beginning. So I didn't, I suppose I'd been thinking about it for two years and it did take us probably six months to negotiate it and figure out how to structure it and to get everything in place because he also had a business. So we actually acquired his bookkeeping business as part of that deal. So there was uh, quite a lot of different factors to consider and bringing his customers across the bean ninjas. The whole thing was stressful because it was kind of like acquiring a business as well as giving up some equity in bean ninjas and then his wage component of that negotiation as well. So yeah, it was fun. I like doing deals and I learned a lot from it, but it was stressful too. That's so interesting. I guess, you know, you could look at it as you taking a big risk, but now that I think about it, he took a risk as well, right? I mean, two years, you could have easily kind of said, like, eh, thanks for coming by, but you got to go, you know? Oh, absolutely. And he was earning a much lower rate as an employee for Bean Ninjas than he was working directly with his own consulting customers. So he took a hit there so that he could prove himself and then he was still running his business at the same time. What did those conversations look like with you and Eduardo? How did you figure out the co-founder that is an equity and how to structure that? Yeah, so I think the coolest part about it was, you know, and I know didn't really know how to structure it at first, but I'm a very emotional guy. <laughs> I very um, I'm driven by the heart on a lot of this stuff. And I think the big thing that I sort of went into it was, was I said, okay, first, we just want to make sure we love working together, which we already had experience on. But then I also wanted to make sure that he was going to be happy there as well and wanted to work on this kind of stuff, which he did. He's a huge digital marketing nerd. I'm a huge digital marketing word nerd. So before I even came up with any numbers, I just went to him and I said, okay, if you're going to go full time on this, I'll give you three options. We can go high salary and little to no equity slash profit share, medium salary and medium equity slash profit share, or low to no salary and all equity slash profit share. Basically high, medium, low risk. And he basically replied and said, there's no chance that ClickMinded does not succeed. Give me all the risk I can take. And it was just like, yes, like that is exactly what I wanted to hear. He was all in. And so, yeah, we ended up coming to a, an agreement pretty fast, very informally, mostly over Slack. <laughs> and we're still pretty tiny and pretty handshake agreement on a lot of things. And then we just move forward. And when the business was doing very, very poorly, he was equally getting his ass kicked like I was. And then now that the business has turned around, he's reaping the rewards as well. So it's been great. And so once you'd negotiated or you arranged the split with Eduardo 
and the handshake agreement, you'd figured it out. Then were you doing that while he was already working in the business or did you have to figure all of that out and then he left his job in New York and things kind of went from there? What did that look like? Yeah, so the way we arranged it was actually also very advantageous for him as well. So, you know, like I said before, we were going to expand to seven full courses. What we ended up doing was when I brought him on, when I reached out to him and said, hey, my back's against the wall, what do you think? We basically just only worked on our SEO course, right? So I'd been working on that for four years already. We already had this massive audience of people that loved it. And we basically recreated, refilmed, redid the entire product and relaunched it on a webinar. And we generated a ton of sales and users and interest on that webinar. And so that sort of succeeded. We did just that one course. Then we had these other six courses. And that's when we sat down, actually flew to New York and we hung out for a weekend and said, okay, where should we take this? What should we do? And he was still working full time at his job. The basic conclusion we came to, and it was all his plan, actually, which was amazing. But the basic conclusion we came to was, I'm not ready to leave yet. The business isn't big enough to support both of us yet. Let's do another launch of all the other products and grow the business to the point where it's so big that I have to leave, that I have to work on it full time. And so it was kind of a one foot in, one foot out sort of situation. But to me, that was very reasonable. And so I was working full time on it. He was working just on the nights and weekends. And the basic idea was if we could get it to the point where it was big enough where he had to work on it full time, then he would leave. We ended up working really, really hard on this new launch for the entire next phase of the business, an entire pivot of the business, rebranding of the business, and you know, moving from one course to seven courses, prepared this massive launch. And after all this treacherous, you know, downward spiral from the first couple of months, we ended up doing the launch, we made $113,000 in seven days. And then the next day, he put in his two-week notice. <laughs> so yeah, the tough times in Bali, but then the highs of a launch like that too. No, that's awesome. Exactly. In hindsight, it was the way we went about sort of getting him out of his full-time job and moving to the next phase of the business, pre-selling it kind of Kickstarter style. We did a lot wrong in the whole journey, but that moment in time was played pretty much perfectly. And so what's next? What's next for you and for Eduardo and QuickMinded? I've now been full-time on this business for two years. We have a small team. We went through, you know, after that pre-sale, we went through a number of other lows. All kinds of things went wrong in the business. We turned it around and we're growing really nicely now. We keep trying new things. Some things work, some things don't. The winds have been compounding and we're moving forward. We're trying a bunch of different channels now. We're creating more content. I think the next phase is going to be working with larger and larger businesses, right? larger partners. We have a number of big companies that are using us for internal training, government and Government agencies are using us to train up their staff and things like that. And we just want to keep growing. We're much more confident sort of what the product is and who the users are. And now we're just sort of improving it every single day. But I have to ask, what was your strategy with the launch? The launch where you made over 100,000 in the seven days. Was that one channel that you were using or was that multiple channels? What was the strategy behind that? Yeah, and so this is also what was part of the problem was that launch went so well that we got way too confident <laughs> because everything else after that for the next six months went absolutely horribly. The big dirty secret there was mostly that, I guess this is one of the upsides, but I had been working so long on this business that you know, the email list was pretty big. People trusted me a lot. Like I'd just been sort of sitting on this site and this email list that was accruing value for a really long time. And all we did was launch the new products to all of our former users, right? So it wasn't really anyone new. It was just, you know, I started the website in 2012 and did this launch in 2017. You could argue that $113,000 in seven days is actually, for me, it was incredible life-changing amount, but you could argue it was pretty tiny for that for that many years, right? 
it's not that I was particularly good at what I was doing. It's just that I was doing it very badly for a very long time. Right. <laughs> and so it just like, it has to work when you're working on it that long, you know? So I remember, you know, people showing up on the webinar like, oh yeah, I signed up for your email list in 2012. What are you doing again? Right. <laughs> like <laughs> it sort of had to work. And so, you know, we got so confident with that launch that we said, oh, we'll just do one of these a quarter. And that was basically the low hanging fruit. Those were our super fans. Those were our, uh, the people that sort of love everything that you do and they kind of sign up no matter what. It was a lot of that. And so we found with all the next couple launches and joint venture partnerships we've done that we haven't had conversion rates nearly as good as that. It was sort of a flash in the pan moment to say the least. And so you talked about now moving to other channels and I'd be interested to hear what it's like for you selling into bigger businesses and government. Will that change the sales process for you? I imagine it's a bit different selling into government with slower sales cycles to selling to an individual digital marketer who's trying to improve their digital marketing skills. Yes. So to be frank, any sort of larger entity sales we've had so far that have been predictably successful has all still been inbound. We are doing outbound sales stuff. It is extremely difficult. And it's also very difficult because I'm in that beautiful, sweet space between hating it and also being terrible at it, right? And so (laughs) it's really, really hard, especially for this type of product. It's so easy as a big company to just put training and development, learning and development at the absolute last place in terms of priority. It's the easiest thing to wait until next quarter to do kind of thing. And so it's been very difficult. But yeah, most of the big enterprise sales that we have had, they're you know, individuals that work at the company that want the company to buy more seats kind of thing. So yeah, we're still figuring that channel out now for sure. But there's a lot there to play with. There's a lot of interest. Tommy, thank you so much for coming on the show. There's still so many other questions I could ask and other things we could talk about, but we're almost out of time. So just wanted to check if you had any other parting words or words of wisdom and then we'll wrap it up. I mean, I know a lot of your audiences, you know, they might run their own business. They might be thinking about running their own business. I think one of the things I got most, I'm realizing now in hindsight that I'm most excited about is just the ability to work on stuff that you want to work on once you get to a point where you have a little bit of breathing room, right? When you first do it, you're going to be absolutely terrified, mortified, and waking up in a cold sweat every day. I'm sorry, it's going to happen no matter what. Then once you get a little bit of breathing room, it's really fun to work on stuff that might not always have a point. And I don't know if you do this at Bean Ninjas at all, but like one example, we just launched... Did you ever play video games in the 90s? A little bit, but not heaps. Okay. So I was playing heaps and... I loved Nintendo and there were these really dorky magazines called Nintendo Power in the US and they were like strategy guides, right? And they taught you like how to beat Mario, you know, even faster or or the codes for certain games. And we found that, you know, there's a lot of search volume for the terms SEO strategy and digital marketing strategy and email marketing strategy. So we decided to create these retro 90s looking digital marketing strategy guides that look like the Nintendo powers from the 90s and launched them last month. And like, we don't know if they're going to work, but no sane boss of my past jobs would have ever allowed me to spend a couple months working on on these (laughs) kinds of things. But we just launched them. They're a ton of fun. And yeah, I think that's been one of the cool things about it is like for anyone that's listening, that's thinking about the next leap is, you know, the money is always a factor. And the upside of being an entrepreneur is great and it motivates a lot of people. But the freedom to work on what you want has always kind of been my first, second, and third place. Freedom to go where you want and freedom to work on what you want. And I feel like now that I'm finally there in terms of working on what I want, it's very sort of life-changing moment. It's the dorkiest thing in the world, right? Saying that my life has changed because I get to work on a dorky 90s looking (laughs) digital marketing strategy guide, right? But in a weird way, it's kind of true. I enjoy the ability to wake up every day and be like, yeah, I'm going to work on something that uh, is incredibly geeky, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. That really rings true. And we actually talk about the Beanie's values and what you've talked about there actually really aligns with our purpose, which is 
freedom of time so you can work on what you want to work on or spend time with the people that you want to spend time with as well as Mm. freedom of location and then financial freedom so it rings true it's a topic we actually talk about a lot on the podcast so tommy thanks once again for coming on for a chat it's been great for sure it was great meryl thank you so much really appreciate it by the way are you wanting support to get paid and make better decisions? We've put together a zero small business toolkit, including cash flow forecast templates and guides to setting up zero. Grab it for free at beingninjas.com slash zero toolkit. And that's X-E-R-O-T-O-O-L-K-I-T.